Welcome everyone to another NASCAR Heat Evolution setup video. This video is about Watkins Glen. So for the first time in any of these setup videos, we're going to be turning left and right. So before we get into the setup, we're going to go ahead and take a look at some lap times. First for the AI at max difficulty, which is 105%. They will qualify on the pole at about 67.8 seconds or 1 minute 7.8 seconds. Their race pace is much, much slower at a minute 11 seconds. So keep that in mind as you're practicing and running around the AI that their race pace is a good bit slower than what they qualify. This is a lot like it is at the restrictor plate tracks of Dayton and Talladega where I can't qualify anywhere remotely close to the front of the pack, but yet whenever the race starts, I run off and leave them easily. So that's something I wish the developers would not do because there's no reason for them to qualify uh, nearly three seconds a lap faster than what they can run in a race. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, but the AI at this track are bad. Um, I ran a race that I'm actually planning on posting uh, a little bit later, and it is it's bad. So if you haven't already run races with them there, just be careful because uh, – they will run into you. They will run you over and push you out of the way. So uh, keep that in mind as you race on this particular track. All right. So with some of that out of the way, let's talk about the lap time that I was able to run with this particular setup that you're looking at. I was able to get down just underneath a minute, nine seconds. My quickest lap is somewhere around a minute, 8.8 .8 seconds, somewhere like that. But really what I spent most of my time doing had nothing at all to do with speed. It had everything to do with getting the car to behave the way I wanted it to behave and react the way I wanted it to react. Because one thing I'm sure of is whenever you're on a road course, the most important thing that you can do is have a setup that is comfortable for you because the most important factor about your lap times is not going to be the setup, but rather the comfort of the car and your ability to handle the car and have it react the way you need it to around the track. So I was able to get down to around a minute, nine seconds. In fact, the replay that I'm going to show you at the end of this video is a lap of almost exactly a minute, nine, it's a minute, nine point zero, and then some odd uh, portions of a second there. So very close to a minute, nine flat for all intents and purposes. Let's go ahead and take a look at the setup itself. And I'm going to start by telling you that my whole goal for this setup was to stiffen up the car. I wanted the car to react much quicker than the default setup did. And what I mean by that is these are big, heavy race cars. Okay. I mean, they're, you know, 35, 3,600 pounds. So whenever you go through a corner, they don't have near enough um, engineering in them, although they've gotten, they've come a long way in that respect, but the way they're designed, they don't have near enough engineering capability to keep the car from rolling over in the corners. So with that in mind, uh, the center of gravity is up pretty high. Again, that's by design. That's not the fault of the teams. It's the design of the car. And so the car wants to roll over. So you have to do some things to try to stiffen up the car and get the car to react quicker, which means that whenever you turn the wheel, the car reacts by actually changing direction. So that was my entire goal, uh, finding ways to stiffen up the car so it would react quicker to my inputs. So with that in mind, the shock settings, tens across the board. Now by default, the shocks were set at somewhere around six, seven or eight for most of the settings. Uh, but again, I wanted to stiffen things up. Uh, so I did not choose to go with very soft shocks and use my tends across the board instead. Left weight is at 50%. Even again, we're turning left and right. And while it is possible that on a track like Watkins Glen, where you're going to be turning predominantly right, it's very possible to use a slight bit of, uh, of weight to the left or right of the car, depending on where the predominant corners are, uh, to help the handling of the car. But in this case, I didn't feel as though it was in my best interest to do so. So I left it at 50-50. The front weight was something that I played around with quite a bit on this particular setup. And that is because I found that one of my most difficult portions was getting the car 
to behave itself on the straightaways. The car wanted to constantly weave back and forth and wander on the straightaways. And the only way, uh, well, one of the easiest ways to get rid of that was to move front weight uh, forward. So the more front weight I added, the more stable the car was on the straightaway. So I decided to stick with the 52% after a lot of testing, stay there, and then gear the setup around that. So moving on to wedge, wedge is at 50%. Although, just like the left weight, don't be afraid to play around with those numbers. In the case of Watkins Glen, you're predominantly turning right. So, with that in mind, you could increase the wedge percentage and actually help the car to rotate in right-hand corners. And, of course, the opposite would be true uh, because, as you know, if we're on the ovals turning left predominantly, then you're going to run that wedge number down to loosen up the car. Well... Since we're turning right here at Watkins Glen, you would want to increase the wedge to help the car rotate in right-hand corners. Front and rear right height, both at the minimums of four inches, so we move on to springs. And as you can see, all four springs are maxed out. The max front springs you can use are 1,200 pounds. Max rear springs you can use 600 pounds. And the reason I did that goes back to what I said at the very beginning stiffen the chassis. I wanted the car to roll as little as possible through the corners and I, can, I tried much softer rear springs in particular going down to 300, 350, but the car just rolled way too much for my liking. Uh, but in your case, depending on how you drive, it may be that you want to soften the front and rear springs. So just keep that in mind. None of these settings are set in stone, nor am I claiming that this is the best setup that can possibly be made. Moving on to the tire settings, 28 pounds on all four tires. Normally, I would like to run a little bit more pressure in the front than in the rear, but the balance worked out good on the car with using even pressures all across the car. And that 28 pounds, you can lower that pressure down. I tested as low as I think 20, maybe even a little bit lower. And the car felt just fine at 20 pounds, but... Um, it didn't quite turn as much as I wanted it to. And then I also tested above 28 all the way up to 50. And the car was still fine, but not quite the grip level that I wanted. So I finally settled on 28 pounds. But this is a number that you can definitely play around with for the front and the rear of the car until you get the tires to feel the way you want them. Camber. Now, I know for the ovals in particular, my camber settings have been maxed out at 10 degrees. Well, in the case of the road course, every time I tried it, it worked, but at the same time, it didn't work. And it's a compromise with camber at a road course because ideally you want to use as much camber as you can because that'll help the, the car to turn in the corners. On the other side, though, the downside of using more camber is that it makes the car more skittish under heavy braking. So if the car wants to, you know, sort of dart left and right under heavy braking, it's probably because you, you've got a little bit too much camber in it. So the way I did it was I tried all the way down to negative one camber on both the left front and right front. Car handled great. The problem was it wasn't quite getting the, the turn that I wanted. The rotation wasn't quite there. So I decided to continue easy, increasing the camber, keeping it even on left front and right front until I got to a point where the car was just a little bit more unstable under heavy braking than I wanted. And then I backed off a little bit and negative 4.5 degrees is where I finally decided on. The next component, which is very important for this particular setup is the front and rear sway bars. Now, normally I have not used the rear sway bar. In this case, I did for the same reason that I used the max settings on the springs. I wanted to stiffen up the car and minimize the roll as much as I could through the corner. So that's why you see the max one inch rear sway bar. Front sway bar, basically the same story. The only difference is I started at two inches, which is the max setting, but then I backed off of that because it was the car was a little bit too tight there and I didn't want to adjust some other settings to try to loosen it up. So I, I simply came off of the front bar setting until the car felt good, but still stable. Moving on to the track bar. The idea for the track bar at the road course for me 
was to get it and keep it as high as I could to help with the rotation through the corner, but not get the car rotating so much on corner entry, particularly that it over rotated uh, through the center of the corner. Now this becomes on a track like Watkins Glen, very important when you get to the bus stop uh, on the back straightaway. And the reason is you're going to be turning right and then quickly back to the left. And if the car over rotates very much at all, you'll get yourself in deep trouble very quickly in the bus stop. So that's why I stopped at 11 inches. Again, if the car isn't rotating as much as you want, feel free to increase that number. Uh, generally with the road course, because you're turning left and right, you want to keep the left and right side settings the same. Brake bias is another individual preference based on driving style. But for me, when I get on the brakes, uh, particularly at this track, I was getting on them very hard. So I wanted to make sure I had enough brake so that I didn't get the car loose on corner entry. So loose under heavy braking is not fun. So I decided to up my normal setting of 71, 72% to about 75. And that seemed to be a pretty good number for me. Again, if you find that the car is locking up the front tires, then you probably have too much front brake in it, meaning that you need to reduce your brake bias. But if you find out that the car under heavy braking is getting very loose, then try moving the brake bias up a few ticks. Grill tape and wheel lock not touched and steering offset is at zero on this track again because we're turning left and right. Now down to the gear setting. The rear end ratio is 3.60. That gets most all of the RPMs uh, particularly important on the back straightaway as, as you come toward the bus stop. Uh, but one thing I would caution you against, and you'll see this and probably be able to hear it on the, the lap that I'm going to show in the replay here in just a few minutes. And that is you want to be very careful with high RPMs at a road course whenever you're also turning. And the reason is if you're turning high RPMs and then you try to suddenly downshift, then it's very likely that the car is going to jump sideways on you and, and become out of control and just sort of slide. And when the car starts to slide like that, it's going to be very hard to do anything other than to just try to maintain the slide until it finds grip again. So be very careful when downshifting. In fact, uh, in the lap you're going to see, I'm very careful about my upshifts and downshifts because I don't want the car to jump sideways on me. I want to keep the car under control at all times. So again, the lap you're going to see is a minute and nine seconds. So stay tuned for that and also stay tuned for more NASCAR Heat Evolution.